Our sermon today is taken from Psalm 137. This is the word of God. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth sang, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skills. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Thus says the Lord. Now I realize, after we just read, a lot of us might be wondering, was that really from the Bible? That was God's word? Because it is talking about something pretty gruesome, right? Approval of smashing children against rocks is objectively horrifying and sadistic. And you're definitely not alone in thinking this. This psalm has been musicalized a few times, and I've never found a version that includes the last two verses. Right? I wonder why. But God did not put this psalm in our Bible by mistake. And as Christians, we are called to deal with all of Scripture, even or maybe especially the parts that are uncomfortable for us. So if you stick with me through the sermon, hopefully by the end of it, we can see that God is not ab- advocating the murder of innocent children here, but it is a raw, impassioned appeal for God's justice. But, but, but for this to happen, we need to put aside some of our modern assumptions and immerse ourselves in the text, as best as possible, putting ourselves in the position of the psalmist before being able to see how it applies to our lives. So let's pray that God may lead us so that we can have ears to hear his truth from this difficult passage. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is, is breathed out by you, Lord, and is profitable for us for teaching us every single word, Father. But in our limitations, we struggle. We struggle to understand you sometimes. I pray, Father, that you can give us ears to hear and send your Holy Spirit to soften our hearts that your truth may penetrate deep into our souls and give us life and joy and hope in you as you read and study this difficult passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one of the things that I've often found myself doing recently after more than six months of being in lockdown is getting pretty nostalgic about the past, right? I find myself watching some movie or video on the internet and I get a look into what the world that's, into a world that seems so distant from the times that we're living in now, right? Seeing the time where it's normal for people to be around each other, going to concerts, festivals, weddings, church. A time where we can travel to another city or country without getting our nostrils stabbed and going into quarantine. When we could be walking on the streets and be seeing faces and not masks. A world where I can generally be around other people without the anxiety of possibly catching a hidden and potentially fatal virus which my elderly parents won't survive. So, watching and being made to remember the way the world once was, the way it should be, can honestly be pretty depressing. At least for me. Because what 2020 has exposed to us, right, is how truly hostile of an environment the world is. And we all, all of us, have experienced some sort of disruptions in our lives. And for some of us, these disruptions have been quite traumatic, haven't they? And because of everything that happened, we've lost our sense of stability, our sense of safety, and a world that was once so familiar suddenly seems foreign. So, and and most of us probably haven't gone anywhere, and most of us can't anywhere, and probably shouldn't. But over and over again, we are confronted by the fact that our city, our jobs, our lives isn't how it should be. And though we're technically at home, we don't feel at home. We become aware of this existential angst, right? The sense that we're strangers in our own existence. And biblical Israel certainly understands how this feels. They themselves have experienced their fair share of traumatic disruptions. And the Bible talks about this angst from this destruction through the concept of exile or being in exile. So today will be our last sermon in our mini-series on the book of Psalms before jumping back into Romans. 
And the psalm that we're studying today, Psalm 137, is a psalm that was written during or maybe even after the time of the Babylonian exile. And here we see the psalm processing this angst of being in exile. And from the psalm, I want to at least point out three things, right? Our three points. One, the experience of exile. Two, the resolve of the exile. And three, hope for the exile. Let me repeat that. One, the experience of exile. Two, the resolve of the exile. And three, hope for the exile. Let's get into it. Point one, the experience of exile. Now, so to really feel the gravity of the psalm, we need to understand what the psalmist is going through here. So let's try to put ourselves in his shoes and imagine the life situation that he's describing, right? So to do this, I think it's helpful for me to give some historical context to the psalm, a two-minute history lesson here. Right, so the psalm here is written by an Israelite exile who's living in Babylon, and we can safely say that this was one of the most traumatic events in the history of Israel. And Israel, as many of us are probably aware, are God's chosen and special people. Right? God made a covenant with their ancestors, promised to give them a land for them to live as God's holy nation. God was supposed to live among them, and his special residence was in this holy city, in the temple, in the city on Mount Zion, Jerusalem. As the story goes, God gave Israel terms and conditions as how to live as this holy nation under his rules, but Israel refused to obey him repeatedly. They continued to turn to worship other gods, refused to do justice to the orphan and the widowed, and they became like the nations who did not know the Lord. And even though God has forgiven them and delivered them over and over again, he sent his prophets to them over and over again to warn them and call them into repentance, giving Israel way more chances than they deserve they continue to rebel, and in fact, they get worse. So God stopped protecting them as he said he would. They didn't repent. God gave them over to the Babylonian empires, and in 587 BC, Jerusalem was sacked and burned to the ground. God's holy temple plundered and destroyed, and its, ham- it, its inhabitants carried off away to captivity. And this is the life situation that the psalmist was talking about in verse 1 to 3. So historians agree that the rivers or the waters of Babylon that we're talking about were these irrigation canals that they got immigrants to build. They would set up labor camps by these projects and they would force people they conquered, like Israel, to migrate there and work there as slaves. So the image of the psalm here is not this peaceful river and the psalmist is having this moment of melancholy there, but it is much more like the cotton fields of America where slaves who were brought from Africa were forced to labor without giving the basic dignity owed to a human. And further investigation on the psalm shows us that the psalmist uh, is a musician, right? He could sing and play the lyre, a sort of mini harp that was a common musical instrument at, at that time, and, and their tormentors were requiring from them a song for their entertainment. So these were people, right, who lost nearly everything. Their homes were destroyed, whatever identity and prestige they had gone. Now they're there as lowly slaves, in a foreign land with their captors bullying them, treating them as clowns, tormenting Israelites um, for their own entertainment and considering their faith to be a joke. And there they wept when they remembered Zion. They were homesick. As you see, Zion is not just a place in the Bible. There is an actual Zion in Israel But in the biblical narrative, it is pointing more to a kind of place. The theological term for that is a type, right, or a totemic emblem for a time and place where we belonged, where everything was good and right, where we had full dignity and honor, a place where there was no lack and we had joy, and most importantly of all, a place where we had an undisturbed connection with God. And this is what the psalmist is really craving. And this is also, friends, what we are ultimately craving for. How? You see, the Bible says we once had a home like this, right? A place that doesn't give us this angst. And that is what's being described in the first two chapters of the Bible, right? In the Garden of Eden. This is the kind of environment God designed us to live in. The kind of place we were made for, our natural habitat. But our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, did not take care of their home as they were supposed to, and they did what was right in their own eyes, exactly what Israel did when they were in Jerusalem. And likewise, God banished them from this home, and so they too went to exile. 
You see, the Bible teaches that the story of Israel is an analog to the story of Adam and Eve, the story of humanity, our story. We too are a people displaced from our true home because of sin, banished from a place that is truly good. And we too then feel this homesickness. How? Well, theologians have argued that human longings are a reflection of this homesickness. Right? This sense of being cut off from the true source of joy, the feeling that we lack something but not quite knowing what it is, and things like our search for spirituality, our passion for justice, our hunger for relationship, and the joy that we have when we experience beauty are all echoes of a tune we have never heard and a, sm and a smell of a flower we've never seen, as C.S. Lewis put puts it. And these longings, then, are signs that are pointing to a place where, sh where we should be, right? And deep down, we really want to be, but have never actually been. And what we often do is we end up turning these longings into idols by trying to seek the things that stirred up by these longings as the thing in itself. And so, for example, we might long for a relationship where we can experience true, unconditional love, where we can be completely vulnerable and unashamed. But in any human relationships that we have in this world, we will eventually and inevitably find that it always is tainted with selfishness and brokenness that's built into it. So if you make this longing an idol by relentlessly seeking human relationships or trying to make the relationship that we have fulfill these longings, we will not be satisfied and will always be met with frustration. Because what we're really longing for is this Adam and Eve relationship in the garden where they can be naked and unashamed before each other and before God. And when we do find a relationship that gives us a glimpse or a taste of that which we really seek, that relationship is not the thing in itself, but an indicator of something greater that we're made for. That we won't be satisfied with our experience of the world as we know it. Because what we truly want is not found here, but in another kind of world, right? A world that once was and a world that is to come. So the longings that we have, like wanting to have unconditional loving relationships, true love, living in a just and peaceful society, beholding true beauty, experiencing peace, are all very good longings. Longings of heaven, in fact. But if we believe we can find them in this world, if we put our hopes finding a fulfillment for these longings on this side of the glory, we will mistake the indicators for the thing in itself. And if we do that, as C.S. Lewis puts it, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of his worshipers. Now, we can tell ourselves that these longings are just tricks that our minds play on us, that the world is just the way it is, right? Frustrating, full of disappointment, and leading ultimately to death. Like, it is what it is. So the echo is all I'll ever get to hear. The world is always bittersweet, and we need to somehow be okay with it. And a lot of Eastern spirituality and religions believe this, right? Believing that life in itself and death is an illusion. So the, the, the solution is to detach ourselves from these longings, to avoid the disappointment and suffering from not having them met. And often the teachings of the secular world also ridicule us for hoping for such a world too, right? Like the psalmist tormentors. They think that our faith is a joke and consider our longing for this heavenly home to be silly and childish utopian fantasies. Because in their worldview, the only thing that is possible for us to enjoy is here. So enjoy it as much as you can while it lasts because after this, there's nothing. To them, the reason why we religious people hold on to our faith is because we fail to, or, and, and we're too weak to accept the world for it, what really is, that this is all there is. Proving what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But friends, the Bible simply paints a different picture of the human condition because it teaches us that God created us for a more glorious existence. So for us, these longings are symptoms of our homesickness, evidence that at least subconsciously we humans are aware that we are in exile, that we too remember Zion, 
our heavenly home, though it might not always be, though we might not always be aware that it is Zion that we're actually longing for. And the angst and grief that we experience in the moments when we realize how far the world is from what it should be, and we find ourselves with very little joy left in the world, so when we too are sitting by the rivers of Babylon, weeping. So on the one hand, we realize that this world is not our home. We long to see the day where God will restore all things and welcome us back to our true home. But on the other hand, we're still stuck here in our tears, broken because how, of how broken everything is. So how do we even function given these conditions? So point two, the resolve of the exile. So we see that psalmist ask a similar question there in verse four. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So remember, right, the psalmist is a musician, and the context is he's being forced to perform in a foreign place while being ridiculed for his faith. So the heart of the question is really asking, how do we worship the Lord while we're in exile? When it seems like all is lost, and doing so doesn't seem like it's doing any good, but it's only going to invite more ridicule and mockery. And we saw in verse 2 that uh, the psalmist is already discouraged. They didn't feel like playing. They hung their instruments on the willows. And that's often a temptation, isn't it? When the things that we long for most is taken from us, we feel the seemingly incurable sadness because this job, this relationship, this lifestyle, or whatever it is that we feel gave us the loudest echo of the tune of heaven is gone. And we become aware that we're in exile so that's easy when we're there to, and understandable to feel defeated, right? Believing that all is lost, that nothing is going to be the same. And what's the point of doing anything? I'll never be as happy again anyway. Just stuck in this depressing spiral of negativity and hopelessness that drains all the energy out of us such that we don't feel like doing much of anything. Let alone sing songs to the Lord. We stay weeping by the rivers of Babylon. So how does the psalmist um, handle this in the midst of this despair? Right? In verse 5 and 6, we see the psalmist resolve that he will never forget his true home by setting it above his highest joy. He says that he would rather his right hand lose his skill or more literally have it become paralyzed and have his tongue t- stuck to the roof of his mouth to lose the ability to sing if he ever forgets Jerusalem. Basically, he was, uh, he's saying that he would rather lose his ability to play music, the thing that he's good at, the skills that he practiced countless hours for and honed, the ability to perform the art that he loves. And again, right, remember that he's in exile, so playing music is probably one of the last things that can give him some sort of joy given the miserable and oppressed condition that he's in. But he said losing sight of his true home is worse than that. The psalmist is refusing to practice and enjoy the thing that he loves if it means that enjoying it means that forgetting that what that joy is supposed to point him to. Right? So, and here is what he is teaching us. Right? The only way we can escape this downward spiral in our, in our season of grief and be in a state where we can genuinely be worshipful to the Lord and sing his songs is by finding our highest joy in our citizenship of our heavenly home. Because ultimately, what is preventing our, our hearts from being repaired is the fact that our highest joy is not where it's meant to be. And behind that is what we talked about earlier, right? We have mistaken the things that give us an echo of heaven for the thing in itself. And so we end up play, placing our highest joys in these echoes. Whatever that may be, right? A relationship, a job, a lifestyle, a, a reputation, and, and when these things become our highest joy, they become idols. And as we, we discussed earlier, that will only lead to disappointment, frustration, and more heartbreak. And so when we do get these things, and they are good and enjoyable things that can be quite heavenly, but they are ultimately echo. So we have to see these things for what they are. And then we can be grateful for what they are. Right? So when we do eventually lose these things, and eventually we will, we can be grateful and thank God that he has allowed us to get 
a taste of this heavenly joy. And so we can look forward all the more eagerly to the heavenly home that, we were, that we'll be welcome to and we're meant to be in. We won't dwell on our losses, but we'll look ahead because the best is truly yet to come. Right? And this anticipation is not false optimism or, or hopeful pipe dreams, right? Because the basis of this hope is not our own calculation, speculation, or imagination, but the infallible, inerrant, eternal promises of God. Amen? So only then, right, can we cancel the noise from the mockery of the world and we can wipe our tears and pick up our instruments. Only then can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And friends, this is not an easy thing to do, right? Later in the text, we see that the psalmist knows the judgment of God will visit Babylon in the future. And I'm pretty confident that the psalmist is aware of God's promises that he will gather them back from where he scattered them, that this exile was, will not last forever, that Jerusalem will be re rebuilt from the ashes. But th this did not stop the psalmist from weeping. So setting our heavenly home as our highest joy does not mean that the weight of the wickedness and brokenness of this world will not be heavy on our shoulders. As long as we're stuck here in this body of death, there will be sorrow, there is still grief, something is inevitably wrong, and it's always unpleasant to go through it. So like the psalmist, the solution to this is to have this resolve, to constantly commit ourselves to finding and seeking joy ultimately in the Lord's dwelling place, in Zion, where His presence is. And it's not a one-time commitment right, thing, right? It is a commitment that we make and we consistently have to come back to when we find ourselves slipping into despair. And although we can't have the fullness of joy now, if we seek Him, we will find Him. And with Him and Him alone will we be home. As Augustine's famous quote says, right, You have made us for Yourself, O Lord, and our hearts will always be restless until it rests in You. You believe that? Brothers and sisters, in this season, it seems like the world is longing for a heavenly home more than ever. And so now, I think it's especially important for us to reorder our joys and put God on top, right? So let's search our hearts and find what truly is our highest joy and how we think we can find it. Because whatever it is and wherever we think it is, it is only an echo of the symphony that we can enjoy in full in Christ. And rest assured, friends, that this exile experience that we're all in will not last forever. Because this too shall pass. There will come a time, the day of the Lord, when the world will be purged from evil and will finally get to go home, where every tear shall be wiped away. Which leads me to the third point, the hope for the exile. Now we get to the difficult part of the passage, right? Because in 7 to 9, verse 7 to 9, we see that inseparable from this deep love and longing for Zion is this profound hatred for that which destroyed it. And what transpires in these verses is like a scene in a courtroom where the victim um, of a heinous crime makes his case against the criminal before a judge. And the first te testimony in verse 7 is against the Edomites, who are actually related to the Israelites. Their ancestor, Esau, was actually the twin brother of Jacob, right? the person after whom Israel was named. But when the Babylonians came, this uh, familiar relation, this blood relation, didn't matter at all because the Edomites actually sold out Jerusalem to the Babylonians. In fact, they helped them attack Jerusalem and rejoice in, the, in their destruction. They even participated in the looting and plundering of the city when the Babylonians broke through Israel's walls, Jerusalem's walls. And the second charge in verse 8 to 9 is against the primary perpetrator herself, Babylon who completely desecrated their homeland in an exceptionally cruel fashion. And this is what's being expressed in the unsettling and graphic imprecation in verse 9. Right? Because verse 9 is really a mirror of verse 8b. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. And if we read the book of Lamentations, we can learn about how truly awful and merciless the Babylonians were. The entire city saw their children being killed in cold blood. The king of Judah, when Jerusalem fell, Zedekiah, 
experienced this in an especially cruel and painful way. How after the Babylonians captured his family, they killed all of his children in front of him, then they gauged out his eyes so that that unimaginably traumatic scene would be the last thing he ever saw. And they let him live and put him in prison to die in chains. So it might be difficult for us to feel comfortable with this request that the psalmist has, but at least we can understand how such hatred came to be. And the psalmist here, right, is not asking God to be especially cruel to the Babylonians, right? He was actually asking this based on what he knew about God. He is only reiterating the strict principle of retribution that God's law required when God's own people harm each other. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Check out Deuteronomy 19. And at the same time, he is asking God to fulfill his promises, to repay to Babylon in full measure to the degree of suffering they imposed on Israel as he declared he would by his prophets. And he's all, only wanting God to do what he has done before, right? Pre- previously to the Egyptians, where the Egyptian firstborn died as a consequence of drowning Israelite babies in the Nile. So my point is, right, at the heart of this request is this burning raw and unfiltered desire to see God's righteous justice, for God to make good on his word, and to visit the evil of Babylon upon them as he said he would. And look, it's definitely not wrong for us to be disturbed by verse 9, especially because these are children here we're talking about. But I would suggest a huge reason for that is because we come from a very different, unique, and very privileged historical and socioeconomic situation relative to the psalmist. Because I'm guessing we've never experienced anything close to the oppression and pain that Israel went through at the hands of Babylon. And so for someone who has gone through something so unimaginably traumatic, a God who does not exact vengeance on behalf of the innocent and justly punish evil, fittingly according to the suffering and damage that it caused, would not call such a God just at all. And if anything, this imprecation teaches us that justice according to the strict principle of retribution can be quite painful and unsettling. But so the question can be, right, does God approve of this prayer? I mean, it's in our Bibles, so should we be praying judgment and destruction against those who have harmed us or destroyed our lives? Well, not really, because we actually have more information than what the psalmist has. You see, Babylon is not only a literal city that once existed either, right? In the Bible, Babylon first appears in the very first book in Genesis chapter 11, where is this wicked city, right? Where humans built in in their attempt to elevate themselves into the level of God and the city that the Lord scatters. And in the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations, it appears at this great prostitute, right? This um, city that corrupts intoxicates and um, destroys human morality and, and as an expression of human corruption. Right? So in the Bible, Babylon functions as this type, this icon that represents humanity's corporate rebellion against God, a paradigm for every evil and corrupt um, empire that humans created. It is a city, the, the city, where the totality of human lust, greed, and corruption is manifested and indulged. It is the exact opposite of Jerusalem. It is the anti-Zion. So the judgment that came upon Babylon um, was not like what the psalmist expected. Because interestingly, um, in the book of Revelation, the risen Christ who sits on the throne and leads heaven's armies against uh, the wicked city is portrayed as a lamb who has been slain. Right, who was bloodied before the battle even began. So it was not like the psalmist expected, not through violence and war, but it was by God sending his own little one to be crushed on our behalf, to take on all the judgment for human sin and corruption, which Jesus did for us on the cross, so that he could call his people out of Babylon so that they may be saved on her day of reckoning, the day of the Lord And Jesus will be the one sitting on the throne as judge over all the earth. And he will send those who refuse to hear his call to come to him into judgment. And then 
the earth will finally be cleansed of sin. And the saints will say, fallen down is Babylon the great. Because that which has threatened and destroyed our heavenly home is now no more. And the new Jerusalem will be brought down to earth. And we finally get to go home. This is the hope that we exiles have. This is what we are really waiting for. So we don't pray judgment upon our enemies anymore because God gave us more than we deserve. We, we didn't receive justice, but grace. Jesus took on all our judgment and gave us forgiveness that we didn't deserve. Right? We, de- we deserve judgment like Babylon does. We were once residents of Babylon, but through Christ, he has made us citizens of Zion, of Jerusalem. So how can we wish this judgment upon anyone anymore when we ourselves have received grace that we didn't deserve? This is why Jesus can say, you have heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, turn the other cheek. That's what God did to us. He turned the other cheek when we struck him with our sins. So brothers and sisters, fellow elect exiles, if you feel the weight and angst that this fallen world seemingly relentlessly tormenting you with, and now you're longing for home and you're weeping, rejoice. Emmanuel has come to comfort you. He has won the victory and he is now preparing a room for you in his house on Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let's silence this noisy, mocking, tormenting voice of our oppressors of this world and set our highest joy on him. Let's put our hopes in the fact that he will take us home. And on that day, he will wipe away every tear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are homesick, Lord. Um, This world is showing to us how truly sinful and corrupt he is. But you, O Lord, has taken on the corruption. You yourself has been crushed by this corruption. And because of that, we have hope in you, in the fact that you will bring down Jerusalem to us. Let us never lose sight of that, Lord. Let us never lose sight of his heavenly home. And send your Holy Spirit such that when we feel these longings, we don't turn to our idols to satisfy them, but we cling to your cross as our hope and our salvation. For in you alone, our hearts will be full. And in you alone, we have peace and satisfaction. And you will wipe our tears. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.